Have you ever been to a concert? Oh, nice. You know, that, that feeling, the crowd, the music, the, the wait time, <laughs> and stuff like that. It's so um, exciting to be at a concert. And every single time I think about a concert, all I want to do is this. <laughs> I did that a couple of times. Now I'm too old to do that, and that won't happen anymore. But if you think about going to a concert or whatever other activity that is similar to going to a concert, you need to do one single thing before going to a concert. That is, uh, go to a ticket website and uh, buy a ticket. Otherwise, it's pretty hard to go to a concert. And then, obviously, stage dive. <laughs> if you look at the same thing from the other side of the spectrum, what they want to achieve when selling us a concert ticket is basically do this. Keep calm and make money. They just don't care about Mauro stage diving anywhere. So it's just make money. The thing is that there's a completely different set of things that should happen from their perspective compared to my perspective. The first one is pretty obvious. They should be able to display Mauro available tickets. Fine. The second thing is that if they do not own the entire ticket set, they need to be able to reserve with the theater. For example, in Italy, if you go to the Milan Theater La Scala, you can buy tickets online on the La Scala website or on Ticket One or Viva Ticket or stuff like that. But they talk directly to the La Scala system in order to reserve a ticket. They do not own a set of tickets. And charge my credit card. <laughs> That's for sure. That's the, the only goal, make money. But obviously, dear will their stuff. That may be marketing things, customer care related activities, if there's some loyalty points or reward cards uh, and things like that, you know. Given that they are going to give me something that has a value, they want to be sure that that something, my ticket, is insured in some way. Because sooner or later they will need to ship the ticket. And if you are a music lover, you want to go to Ticket One, for example, buy a fun ticket because you want to have that ticket. So the print at home thing, no, thank you, no. I don't want my printer to print something black and white on a piece of paper. I want the fun ticket. So they need to ship tickets tomorrow. Tickets need to be insured because they don't, they, in order to make money, the last thing that they want to do is to lose money because they can lose my ticket or Post Italiana can lose my ticket. In this list of activities, sometimes order doesn't matter. So if we're thinking about uh, loyalty cards, customer care, internal marketing stuff, wh whenever that thing happens, who cares? Can be at the same time at, as Mauro buying the ticket or days later. It really depends on their business case. And it's an internal business case. So order is really not important. Sometimes it does. It happened to me once to go to, well, I woke up once and said, I want to buy a tablet. Fine, I never, had I never had one. So I want to buy a tablet. And so I went to the website. And in order to buy one of those nice looking tablets, x86 with a detachable keyboard. Uh, I'm not going to tell you where this comes from, but anyway, nice looking tablet. And I did the entire process, put in my shopping cart, check it out, paid with the card. Uh, and a couple of hours later, I received an email saying, order accepted, thank you very much. We'll get back to you as soon as the item is shipped. Fine, lovely. Two days later, I received an email saying, tablet shipped. Wow, fine. Two seconds later, I received 
a text message on my phone from the credit card company saying, transaction denied. Whoops. And now, I was pretty sure that the email was just sent out before realizing that. And that's it. So I sadly, I sadly said to myself, you won't receive a tablet. The first thing I did was call the credit card company that uh, due to privacy reasons, they didn't tell me why my own credit card denied the transaction for my privacy. Mm, but, but that's another story. The funny thing is that the morning after, DHL shown up with my tablet. The seller went on for six months trying to charge my credit card. And for six months, the credit card company denied the transaction. I couldn't know in any way why the transaction was denied. I phoned the support system of the seller saying, hey folks, I have your tablet and I didn't pay it. What should we do? And the lady on the phone told me, I know. But from the CRM perspective, if it's shipped, it must be paid. <laughs> so keep your tablet and live happy. And I say, OK, thank you very much. <laughs> Fine. So <laughs> if you want to make money where order is important, uh, mm, be careful. But <laughs> if you think about the entire things, all the stuff uh, involved in this, uh, let's call it a transaction. There are important bits. Unless you are a bank, or unless you are the credit card company, you don't own the credit card system. So you, are, you, you sell tickets, and you reach out to someone else saying, can you please charge this credit card for me? And that someone else is outside of your control. So what the problem really is, it's basically that sooner or later we'll find ourselves in this scenario where that's my ticket, pretty big one, but that's my ticket from their perspective. And uh, all these guys <laughs> dealing with my ticket are the internal systems or the systems involved in the buying process. So there's insurance, credit card, marketing, shipping, warehouse, and down there, customer care. <laughs> so we're Italian, so customer care is just, mm, oh, we have customer care as well, so who cares? The thing is uh, that credit card and insurance, and probably shipping as well, is not part of the ticketing system. But in order to try to keep all these things together, we have this guy over there called the DTC. So we have someone that is trying to handle this sort of distributed transaction across multiple people dealing with one single resource. And what about these two ones? Failover. Given that we have a, now a single point of failure, other than my ticket somewhere, we have these two guys sitting there doing nothing, wasting basically resources, waiting for this one to fail and being able to step in saying, OK, now it's my turn. I'll be the next one failing. So what's the real issue under here? Is that we have um, multiple resources and multiple owners. If you think about it, we went on talking about a ticket, but it's not really a ticket. It's a ticket from my perspective. It's something they sell from the finance system perspective or sales perspective. It's something that is shipped, that is a completely different concept uh, that, well, w we have given the same name to the same thing. But if you ask to someone that works in the shipment department, uh, what is that? Uh, it's an envelope that might contain a ticket, one or more. I just don't care. It's an envelope. From sales perspective, it's money. <laughs> Where this money comes from, I just don't care. 
And the, the other interesting thing is that uh, if it is an electronic ticket or a printed home ticket, from sales perspective, it's just money. So the, the, the medium doesn't really matter. So it's, we, we, we all call it a ticket, but it's in reality, these are different resources owned by different owners. Shipping is an owner. Finance is an owner. Insurance is an owner. That might be a third party. So we need to start talking about, uh, or thinking about, transaction boundaries. That's very important, especially when we start dealing with something that is outside our control. For example, the credit card system that might fail and we don't want to ship another tablet tomorrow. Well, <laughs> depends on the point of view. So we have, the, the, the interesting deal here, here is that we have um, something that from my perspective, it's a one go. So from my perspective, it's just a single operation. I clicked, check out. That's it. Fine. Charge my credit card. That's the only thing I want to do. From their perspective, their perspective, sorry, these are multiple operations that should be in some way atomic. That is that where that some way is my perspective. It's a go or no go. From their perspective, there's multiple steps, multiple things going on, multiple things that might go wrong, but all in all, the thing should be go or no go. So it's not atomic in the A of acid terms of thing. So it's not a begin transaction, commit transaction, or rollback transaction. It's just a, a process that should happen or should do something else. We should call it a business transaction. Unfortunately, there's transaction <laughs> in the name. So call it long-running business workflow. It might be a better name. Anyway, we end up with a business transaction that spans multiple boundaries. We have to involve multiple boundaries. There's no way we can do that without contacting the credit card system unless we want to buy the credit card system and put it into the, our system and set up the DTC and the DTC failover and yada, 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 yada. So we need to deal with ticket reservation, credit cards, insurance, shipping, our internal stuff, and more and more and more. And in some cases, as we said, order is important. Sometimes it's not. So we have this big ball of mud, and we should stop using the big ball of mud. Because uh, every single time we cross uh, a service boundary, so every single time we try to talk to shipping from finance perspective or from orders management perspective, we cannot expect a transaction, where a transaction is a DTC transaction, to work. It's just a no-go. We tried several times. So w WS transactions uh, was a nice attempt to make transaction distributable. It was a nice failure at the same time. So from the service-oriented architecture perspective, boundaries are explicit. And in my opinion, this is one of the most important tenets out of the four. And it's also the most uh, misunderstood concept in domain-driven design, that is bounded context. We, as engineers, uh, usually start thinking about domain-driven design as, how should I design my class that inherits from I aggregate? Mm, no, thank you, no. The thing is that we need to find boundaries at first, uh, and finding boundaries is a nice way to prevent transactions, uh, technical transactions, to span multiple boundaries. So, how should we fix the thing? Is there a way to fix the thing? Obviously, one important bit is forget the DDC. The second thing, obviously, is that as soon as we start forgetting about DTC, we lose this confidence. Can I say confidence in English? Confidence that um, <laughs> we have exactly once semantic. 
So transactions are a nice way to turn around the thing that in real life doesn't exist. Try to fall off a bike in a transactional manner. Try to cross a, traffic, a red traffic light in a transactional manner, hoping that everything goes as expected. It simply doesn't work. We are so used in real life to compensation. That's not a matter at all. What is the problem? So before coming to Rome, I planned a weekend with wife in Rome. So we, we reserved tickets for a night at the Colosseum tomorrow night. All fine, paid, correctly charged, correctly delivered. All good. Two days ago, given this thing that is going to happen tomorrow in Rome, the, 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 the owner of the Colosseum sent us an email saying, sorry people, your night at the Colosseum has been cancelled. You will be refound. That happened 12 days after the thing. There is no transaction lasting 12 days where they can roll back the payment request. They just compensate. We will send you a refund. That's so easy. Obviously, as you, start, as you stop dealing with exactly once, strange things might happen, where things might happen twice or more than twice. Because you're dealing, to, you're dealing with something that is not under your control, and maybe where the protocol is something a bit fluffy as HTTP. So you can issue a request to your credit card system, and the request goes out fine, but you never receive a response. And now, what happens? What should I do? I sh should I simply reissue that request? Obviously. The problem is that if the target system is not idempotent, you don't want to charge the user credit card twice. So idempotence is, is one of the key topics when dealing with no transactions at all. One interesting way to deal with this thing is through messages. So, there's three important aspects of messages. One is that messages are atomic. Messages should be designed so that I can send a message to Giuliano. And with that message, Giuliano is good enough to make a step forward in his portion of the system in a new consistent state. Should never happen that I can send um, Message A, message C to Giuliano, and never send message B. Because the, the messages should be atomic. So from Giuliano's point of view, there should be no way to say, well, uh, given that I received A, the next one must be B. Because the atomicity is spawned across multiple messages. At the same time, messages are unique. So, Messages are uniquable, identifiable, uniquely identifiable, meaning that all queuing technologies out there allows you to generate a message ID that is stable across multiple derivatives of the same message. And if you think about it, if you think about it, that's sometimes, well, most of the times, good enough to start implementing idempotency, because the target system can say, I've already seen this ID. If I've already seen this ID, it means that the, the deliverer probably never received my response, just sent back a new response. Exactly the same as before. But the most important thing is that messages tell stories. So you can look at the message flow and understand what the overall status of the system is. And you can try to say, okay, what's the point now? Have we already charged Mauro's credit card? Are we ready for shipping? What should we do next? Looking at the history of what happened, we can make new decisions. But when it, come to, when it comes to messaging, there's two main messaging patterns. The first one is called request response. So I talk to someone, and that time someone talks to me. 
So there's a message flowing from someone and flowing back. Just one single point. Messages is, are all about one way, fire and forget. That's it. There is no, from the technological point of view, there is no thing like uh, acknowledgement that the receiver has done something with my message. I just sent out a message. This pattern is built on top of this concept. So I can send the message out to someone else, and that someone else can reply me back. We perfectly know each other. We know the language that we should speak each other. Otherwise, there is no comprehension. So request response implies some sort of coupling. The larger the vocabulary is, the higher the coupling is. Because the larger the vocabulary is, the more complex it is to change that vocabulary. Another interesting, super interesting pattern is called PubSub. That should be really called SubPub. But it eh, doesn't sound so nicely. So an event is broadcasted, and that event is something that has happened in the past and is immutable. Order accepted. Credit card charged. There is no way to change that fact. There is no way to, say, to change the fact that Mauro clicked on the checkout button. That's the thing that ha happened. Subscribers know where the publisher is and know what the publisher publishes. To some extent, this implies less coupling. Because I, as a publisher, knows nothing about my subscribers. Nothing, literally nothing. You just come to me and say, please, Whenever this thing happens, just send me a message. I'll take care of dealing with the vocabulary in the message. That's a subscriber issue. And they need to know where I am. I just don't care about where they are. So if we think about the my ticket, we have Mauro saying, check out request on the website that generates an event, uh, order submitted event, that is handled by marketing that deals with internal stuff. But at the same time, because there is no dependency at all between marketing and shipping, for example, why the hell do they need to be in the same transaction? There is no good reason at all. So shipping is interested in knowing that someone <laughs> is trying to buy something. But at the same time, finance is much more interested in knowing that Mauro is trying to buy something. And finance immediately tries to reach out to the credit card system. Given that all these things happen in parallel, now shipping is trying to talk to warehouse, saying, can you please collect all the items that need to be shipped to this address, with this weight, with this delivery, requirements and stuff like that. And while that happens, uh, the credit card system replies back saying, yeah, you're good to go. And so finance says, OK, order paid. And at the same time, or sooner or later, warehouse says, collection completed. So we have the package ready to be shipped. And now shipping has the two meaningful events uh, that allows shipping to say, I can ship the tablet. So shipping talks to a FedEx gateway, or whatever courier you want. That FedEx gateway says, OK, I'm fine. I can ship the stuff. And order is shipped. Order is shipped could be an interesting event from the marketing perspective once again, because they want to keep track of the, the overall time the order took, pla took, to took place. The interesting thing now is that if we have, notice, more boxes. So if we have scaling issues in one of these nodes, we can scale them out. So we can say, are we having issues in the finance node? Yes. Is it a throughput issue? Yes. Deploy more nodes. We just don't care. Because now messages being atomic, can be handled by multiple nodes at the same time, because just one node will handle one message. 
So if we, if you think about uh, a, <laughs> a corner case scenario where we have nodes uh, single threaded, single process, single threaded, it's a node. So it's a machine with one process, with one thread. And we have 10 messages in the queue incoming. They will be processed one by one. If we deploy 10 nodes, they will be processed in parallel. But they are completely independent, one from each other. They are 10 different payments. Serialize them in any way. And the other interesting thing is that if something goes wrong here, we can retry. Because the message is enough from the receiver perspective to restart the process. That is a single bit of the process. When it comes to transaction, this will be in one single transaction. The thing is that the message is accepted. It starts the transaction. We do the HTTP request to call the credit card system. That might fail, but at the same time, something else internally fails. The transaction rolls back, and we know nothing of that resource that is outside of our control. So it's not in the same transactional boundary. So now, our system, if something goes wrong with the payment, eh, credit card is not available, payment failure, we won't ship. Because we, we are not going to publish any event from here. So shipping will be in some sort of an unknown state, saying, OK, I collected stuff, and I'm not going to ship. Obviously, we'd love to pay, to, sorry, to publish another event see, here saying, OK, payment failure, so that shipping can go back to warehouse and compensate and say, OK, take back this thing. I'm going to throw the package away. We wasted some money, but it's much better than delivering the tablet to Mauro. So messages, in a nutshell. There's uh, less coupling between services, or call them, if you will, microservices, in your system, but you need to respect your boundaries. There's no temporal coupling. If you need it, you can have two pieces of the system talking to each other without requiring these two pieces to be alive at the same time. You just send out a message and go on doing your, your stuff. When that system, will, that, that system, that service will receive the message, they will do whatever they need to do, and probably, probably they will publish an event that you can use to react and move forward. There's much less <coughs> maintenance and much less deployment headaches. Because now we can take out a portion of the system, let's say that finance needs to be changed. Or we need to introduce a new payment method. That is not a direct transaction payment method. So it's a wire transfer that works in a completely different way from direct compared to direct transactions. In a monolithic system, it's basically impossible. Now we can introduce a new payment system that deals with wire transfers. And shipping will just wait for the payment succeeded event. Whenever it will happen, it just doesn't matter. It's much easier to scale out because we have competing consumers. That is a way we have an incoming queue, and we can uh, put in front of that queue how many nodes we want in order to consume messages. If one node fails while it's consuming a message, it's not a problem at all. There's a peak and lock logic between nodes and queues. So the message will be in the queue, but hidden to all others while that node is consuming the message. And if the node fails, the message is rolled back. And we have guaranteed delivery, because queuing systems are, all ab are only about guaranteed delivery. And that's it. So my name is Mauro Servienti. I work for uh, Particular Software as a solution architect. We are the makers of uh, N-Service Bus. Some contact information. Thank you very much. And go and tell stories. Thank you.